is William, your videographer from Two Hacks Publishing. Welcome to the College of Complexes, being held at Barbex Restaurant at 8949 Garland Road, Dallas, Texas. Gently embracing the east side of White Rock Lake. When I entered, I was greeted like coming home to Grandma's house. Warm and friendly. When visiting the Barbex Restaurant, tell them you want your reservations for the next College of Complex class. Well, welcome to the College of Complexes. Our speaker went home to get something as he forgot. He's going to bring it back. He'll be here any minute. But we should start. It's, uh, well, we, we had an announcement, whatever. We can do that till he gets here. Anyway, uh, everybody's babbling. We put a speaker on every week, a different subject. We require our speakers to take a position on an issue, express a point of view. They gotta be for or against something, they don't care what it is. What? Oh, you're listening, all right. And uh, we give them an hour to make a presentation. They go over an hour, we cut them off. If uh, anybody interrupts the speaker, we remind, the interrupt, we remind the interrupter that we only listen to one fool at a time. And then we have questions and answers, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals. Everybody in this audience at once who gets five minutes at the podium to respond to what the speaker said for or against. Then the speaker gets to comment on the comment and close the meeting. That's how it works. Anyway, uh, for is any, now is the time, if anyone has any announcements, now is the time for announcements. Marjorie, do you have any announcements you want to make? Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> now is the time, see? Make your okay. Uh, on the 10th, which is next Tuesday, there is an observance of uh, International Human Rights Day, which is taking place at the Communication Workers Hall on 1408 North Washington, which is between Ross and Live Oak, on uh, December 21st. At 5 p.m., there's an anti-surveillance protest at Dealey Plaza. And another thing, a num number of things uh, kind of got snowed and iced out this week. Oh, and on Thursday, this coming Thursday at 1.30 p.m. on uh, Cockrell Hill Road, just south of I-30, there is going to be a protest of of threatened cuts to Social Security, and the the Grinch will be there. The the Grinch who stole Christmas, because they're they're going to have this. They're going to try to cut people's Social Security uh, three days after Christmas, and it's in conjunction with a national call-in day. People are supposed to call Congress and te uh, and just raise holy heck. What's that feedback from? Where is the speaker? Anyway, uh, any other announcements to be made? Anyone else have any announcements they want to make? Susie, do you have any announcements? Usually have them. Oh, all right. You want to make it up here? No. Okay. Any announcements? Okay, I've got uh, next Saturday we have uh, uh, Michael Helson. He's a poet, scholar, and avid researcher. He's going to discuss how, what happened to the Casiars. He's going to discuss how, <clears throat> it's, uh, I don't want to read all this to you. You have it in front of you, and I don't want to put you to sleep, but uh, anyway. He's going to discuss how a Jewish kingdom in Central Asia flourished in more than 200 years, for more than 200 years, and then vanished suddenly from history. It will cover Arthur Kessler, who thought he had solved the mystery and what became of his solution. Mike's presentation will culminate in a novel, The Dictionary of the Kaziars, which is published both male and female versions, will awaken our senses as to what can be explored and revealed. Anyway, that'll be interesting. That's next week. 
Uh, <clears throat> then we have uh, two weeks off, uh, December 21st and 28th, there'll be no meeting due to Christmas and New Year's. And then uh, January 4th, we have New Year's resolution predictions for the next 100 years. So if you have any predictions that you want to make, that's the meeting to make them. It'll be recorded and who knows, maybe 100 years from now, someone will listen to what we had to say. So that ought to be good. Anyway, uh, our speaker isn't here yet. He went home to get some things. He's supposed to be right back. We're going to put him on at 6.45 due to the fact that he had food here, told him to eat. And, uh, but he should show up any minute. When he does, we're going to put him on. We, we took care of all his preliminaries. He said he was going to duck home and come right back. Well, welcome back again. Is this thing working? Yes. Yeah, all right. Welcome back to the College of Complexes. Our speaker tonight is standing right here, Lloyd Chappelle. He's a historian and economist. He's, a, he's going to discuss the fall of the Roman Republic. What does the death of the Roman Republic teach about human beings? And, what, and can we apply these insights to our troubled times? It will show how in the space of 100 years, Rome was transformed from a republic with democratic institutions into an empire under control of our one man, Augustus. How did this happen? Although not a democracy like modern Western democracies, the Roman Republic was the pride of even the poorest Roman in the world, where most of their neighbors were ruled by absolute autocracies. <laughs> Citizens had the rights that the Mediterranean world could only dream about. The fall of the Republic is best documented time in all of Roman history, but is poorly understood by most Americans. America is not the new Rome, although many of the problems sound familiar. A vast gap of wealth between rich and poor, rampant political corruption, a ruling oligarchy, out of touch and unconcerned with the needs of its people, and a ruling elite passionately driven by their maintaining their power and prestige. Although history never exactly repeats itself, Lloyd will show there is much to learn from Rome's dysfunctional government and its fall into absolute autocracy. So without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, uh, Lloyd Chappelle. Thank you. I thought I would enjoy speaking about something that nobody would argue with me about. <laughs> Good luck with that. In the space of a in the space of a hundred years, Rome changed from a republic, very different from ours, to an autocracy where one man made all the decisions and one man was above the law. How did this happen? Oops. Yeah, we have visual. We may have to turn the lights off. Rome had a republic that lasted longer than any other republic in the ancient world. The Athenian democracy lasted about a hundred years and was actually despised in most of the Mediterranean world. The Romans were not like the Greeks. They did not have one person, one vote. But yet, a Roman citizen could not be arbitrarily arrested. They could not be tortured. They got to choose their magistrates. Their system was not perfect, but it worked for them for a long time. In a very short period of time, it was all gone and they, the Italians were not to return to democracy for some 1900 years. In this presentation, we will look at why did the Roman Republic fall and what can it teach us? Because we know human nature being what it is, some things don't change. Rome is, America is not the new Rome. We are very different from Rome and the founding fathers made sure we would not go the way of Rome but many of their problems seem very similar today. We will look at what we can learn about this and what does this tell us about human nature. If we look at 200 BC, the Roman Republic has been around some over 300 years. Rome has just finished what it would consider its world war. It went to war with the city-state of Carthage and after the second war, it just barely won. 
Money is starting to flow into Rome as it never has before. Their values are starting to change. The Romans were a very stern, austere, and frugal people. But once the money started to flow in and they saw the incredible wealth of Carthage and Sicily, things were not the same. One of the diehards for the old traditional Roman values was a man named Marcus Portius Cato, who we call Cato the Elder. He decried the changes in the Roman character. He's described uh, by uh, 200 years later by the Greek writer Plutarch as a man who preferred a light breakfast, had a very mild supper, loved poor clothes, believed in duty and honor. In many, many of his writings, he talked about the ruin of Roman morals, but he was one of the few. The Roman, Romans kicked out their king in 508 BC. They had had a really horrible king, and they were determined that they would never be ruled by the arbitrary, arbitrary justice of one man again. To replace the king, they elected two magistrates called consuls. These men were supreme military commanders and the head judges. Because to the Roman, there was no difference between being a military leader and a judge. Below them, they had junior magistrates called praetors, who would be, the consuls would be like major generals and the praetors would be lieutenant generals. And then they had financial officers. The Roman system was very similar to Great Britain and that most of it was not written down. Some of it was written down, but they worked on a system of precedent and tradition. All of their government worked without pay. All of their generals and officers worked without pay. And by this time, their soldiers were paid like a ditch digger's uh, wage. The Romans called their republic res publica, from which our word republic comes from, which means the public thing or the public affair. The Romans tended to be a massively conservative people. With all their social convulsions, with their demands for constitutional reforms and more right for the common people, they still had a great distaste for change. There was five voting assemblies in Rome, but only two had any real power. The first was the Comitia Quinturiata. They passed laws, declared war, ratified treaties. They nominated all of their magistrates. But the, with the Roman system, the very wealthy voted first, and their votes meant more. Also, there was a revolt against this in the 5th century BC, and the common people had their own assembly called the Concilium Plebis. Their laws became binding on all citizens, including the wealthy. In many ways, the Roman system was not that particularly democratic compared to us. In the fifth century BC, the poor people actually rose up against the wealthy, and they went to a surrounding hill next to Rome and started their own government, and essentially they seceded. They told the aristocrats that they would not fight their wars and they would not serve them unless they had a voice in government. And from that started what was called the tribal assembly of the plebs. They even got their own officers called tribunes, tribunes. The tribunes were very, they were not magistrates, but they were officers of the government. They could introduce legislation, and the amazing thing is that they could veto any magistrate or any assembly, any bill. The Romans were determined that never again would one man control the entire state. Part of the way that they did this is that public office could only last one year. The power, the way that things worked, was you had the magistrates, the senate, and the popular assembly. The Roman system changed slowly over time, and they had many arcane practices which to us seem quite bizarre, but it reminds me, if you were to see the kitchen of an eccentric old man who had kitchen equipment from the 19th century and the 20th century and some 
digital stuff from the 21st century, you would look at this kitchen and go, oh my God, how does anybody get anything done in this kitchen? But to the Romans, it worked quite well, and it worked for over 400 years for them. In their political system, they believed in limited tenure of office, something we could consider, and collegiality. Always a government official had someone who could veto them. He could be overruled. Consuls could overrule consuls. Praetors could overrule praetors. Tribunes could come in and shut everything down, though they really rarely did. And yet somehow this system worked for them. The most powerful part of the Roman government was the Senate. The Senate survived as an advisory body from when the Romans had kings, when they kicked out their king in 506 BC. The amazing thing about the Senate, they were the most powerful, but they could not legislate. They had provided the leadership and the generals for Rome's many, many great wars. And because Rome had won all of its wars, the group that produced them had tremendous prestige. They would make ruling decisions. Those decisions would go to the voting assemblies, and they were automatically passed. It's interesting that the Senate was originally old money, the aristocrats, but eventually it became new money. They allowed the super rich, when the common people became wealthy, they too could, could serve in the Senate, although they didn't have blue blood. The Senate's main domain was foreign policy and state finances, and that was not to be tampered with by anybody else. All over Rome, you see the symbol SPQR, which stands for Senatus Populusque Romanus, which literally means the Senate and the people of Rome. The common people saw the wealthy aristocrats that ran the Senate, they saw that they were in partnership with them, even though they looked down their noses at them. One of the interesting things about Roman politics, they loved successful generals as magistrates. They just love that. And there are many examples of great generals who were horrible politicians and good politicians who were terrible generals. <laughs> also, in the Roman political system, if you were an aspiring politician and you had no credentials and no accomplishments and nothing, you would run on the reputation of your family. <laughs> I guess like some people would say, like George W. Bush. The interesting thing about the senators, they were enrolled. They were not elected. They, you had to pass property qualifications. You had to be stinking rich to serve in the Senate. By 150 AD, at BC, the Senate was the primary, the most powerful body in the Roman government. However, it started out that the tribunes, the people elected by the common people who had the ability to veto any assembly and any politician, when they started to introduce legislation and bypass the Senate, the most powerful system, the most powerful group, Rome started to unravel. In many ways, you could say our system is a democratic oligarchy or an oligarchic democracy. The Romans were very much that way. One of the things that interfered with Rome, with democracy as we know it, is something called the clientela system. When you see the movie The Godfather, as it opens up, the Godfather is like holding court, and people come in and ask for favors. Rome was an extremely hierarchical society. Status was everything. And you would have patrons and clients. That was the way the common people got, got access to the wealthy and their connections. You would come in, you would ask the godfather for something, and then the godfather would ask, would tell you, I will call upon you to do you a service. All of the wealthy had incredible numbers of clients, and clients always voted for their wealthy politicians who were their patrons. Also in the Roman system, Roman politics worked not one person, one vote, but voting blocks of people. And when a majority was reached, all voting stopped. 
the wealthy received more votes, even though there was less of them, because they contributed more to politics. And the Romans were very happy that if you gave a life of public service, you should be rewarded and you should have more say than the people who do nothing for the government. Another interesting thing about how their system was less democratic than ours, only uh, political officers, tribunes, and consuls could call for a meeting. The common people could not ask for a meeting of the people. And when there was a meeting of the people, only the tribunes or the magistrates could speak or the people who were invited to speak. I have a fancy flow chart that shows us, um, oh my gosh, my fancy flow chart is ruined by this uh, wood wall. <laughs> but we have our Comitia Venturiata making our voting in our consuls and our praetors in the plebeian assembly, getting plebeian tribunes and how things work. Uh, it's kind of wasted, sorry. By 146 BC, Rome was the master of the Mediterranean world. They either controlled everything or when they told people to do things, it got done. Eventually, all of those people became under Roman domination. A new class of people showed up called the Equites. These had been the people who had served in the Roman cavalry the past 300 years because in the Roman military system up to this time, everybody provided their own equipment. And if you were in the cavalry, you had to provide your own horse, which means you had to be wealthy. It was the senatorial class and the equites who were as rich as them, but not involved in politics. They started to become tremendously wealthy from Rome's wars. From the great profits of the wars, and the great profits went predominantly to the wealthy, it started to make serious changes in Roman society. Rome had won its wars predominantly with citizen farmers, men who could provide their own military equipment. However, the wealthy started something that was later called latifundia, which was they would buy giant estates, giant plantations, and hordes and hordes of slaves came into Italy from Rome's conquests. There was no way the little guy, soldier farmer, with his little farm could compete against these giant plantations. Further, Rome's wars lasted longer and were much farther away. Macedonia, farther Spain, the Middle East. Men could be away from their homes 10, 15, 16 years. Many times when they returned, there was no farm to return to or it was dilapidated. And the wealthy plantations tried to buy their land so that not only is the base of the army eroding, the Roman economy is changing to slave labor. When the citizen soldiers were dispossessed of their farms, they became the urban poor of Rome and it caused a huge problem who will fight in the army. And we have to remember that the Mediterranean world, virtually every year, someone was either attacking Rome, their allies, or Roman freedom. Well, you see this slide is entitled The Road to Hell is paved with good intentions. A reformer came along. And to, in the ancient times after the fall of Rome, it was realized, in the modern times it was realized that when the reformers started up, showed up to help the common people, they botched it and they set into motion the fall of the Republic. This is many times referred to by historians as the Roman Revolution, but it's not a revolution for political ideals. The two men who started it were brothers. They were blue bloods. They had peerless lineage. Their grandfather was Scipio Africanus, the guy who beat uh, Hannibal, Rome's great, great enemy. One of them, on his military duty, because every Roman politician spent 10 years in the army before they went into politics. Tiberius Gracchus noticed as he was traveling through Etruria, north of Rome, that many of the Roman farms were dilapidated or gone and he saw these giant plantations full of hundreds and hundreds of slaves. He writes,
the savage beasts of Italy in their particular dens. They have places of repose and refuge, yet the men who bear arms have nothing. The men who have suffered for Rome live in hovels. It took him four years to get into politics, but finally he finished his military duty and he decided he would do something about this. In Rome, Rome had conquered all of Italy, and when they conquered different areas, part of those people's land was confiscated by the Roman state. A law had been passed in 330 BC, long before this, 150 years before this, saying that citizens could only use 220 acres. But many of the wealthy had taken vast tracts of public land, they farmed it, they would improved it, and Tiberius Gracchus, who became a tribune of the people, he passed, he wanted to have a bill passed that this law would be enforced and that the wealthy would have most of their la the public land that they had kind of squelched taken away from them. But he did this the worst possible way. Remember, Rome was a system of precedent. You did things in a certain way. So a bill this contentious would have to go to the Senate. The Senate would have to approve. They are the most powerful organization in the state. However, he went straight to the plebeian assembly of the common people. This was a huge slap in the face to the Senate. No one had ever done this before, and the Senate struck back. One of the ways that the Senate struck back is even though the tribunes represented the common people, they could be bought, and they had been bought, some of them, for a very long time. Tribunes could veto any voting, anything. And they got a fellow named Marcus Octavius to veto Tiberius Gracchus. Tiberius Gracchus got on his knees and begged. He cried, he pleaded, please, this is for the Roman people. Then he announces to Octavius, you are evidently not serving the Roman people. You should be deposed. I will call another meeting. He called another meeting, and in this meeting, he pleaded again to Octavius to please rescind his veto and allow this to pass so this land could be confiscated from the wealthy and given to the poor Romans. But there's one massive flaw with this. What do poor Romans know about farming? Most of them went broke. And uh, he then had Gaius Octavius deposed from office. This was his first massive mistake because in Roman politics, you always had someone who could veto you, so that you could never hold enough power to oppress anyone. The Senate struck back. The law was eventually passed, but it required a commission of three politicians to go around Italy, have surveyors, assess 220 acres to be given to whoever had it, and the rest was to be confiscated, and then it had to be given to the poor. However, the Senate voted them only the equivalent of 10 cents a day, so it cut it off in its track. But then we come to Tiberius's next huge mistake. It turns out that in Western Italy, the king of a land now called Pergamum, of which the beautiful wrecked city of Ephesus is still there, he died and he bequeathed his entire kingdom to Rome. I guess he figured they were gonna be absorbed by Rome anyway, so why not, you know, let the Romans move in? Pergamum was rich. It was stinking rich. Tiberius Gracchus knew it. So he went to the, to the popular assembly and he had another law passed that when this huge amount of money comes to the Roman treasury, it will pay for his land commission to take the land away from the rich folks. This was his second gigantic mistake. Because foreign affairs and finance was the realm of the Senate. These were the wealthiest folks in the land. They didn't appreciate anybody tampering in their domain. Well, Gracchus didn't think that he had enough time to get everything done, so he ran for his second election. Again, I had mentioned limited term of office. To the aristocrats, this was totally unex unacceptable. Gracchus called a political meeting on one of the hills of Rome to plan his uh, second campaign. And the crowd swelled around him. He took his hand and touched his head to tell his followers he was really concerned. But the Senate had spies watching him. The spies ran back to the Senate 
and said, Gracchus is calling for a crown. And to their eyes, because he had already transgressed Roman precedent, they thought that he would bring tyranny to Rome. They were in a meeting house right next to the political meeting. The meeting house was full of benches. They broke up the benches. They took the bench legs. Uh, the, uh, the, Senate, uh, the consul, one of the consuls at the time got all of his clients and all of his slaves and they beat Tiberius Gracchus and his 300 followers to death. Then they threw Gracchus's body into the, the Tiber River like a common criminal. Gracchus had violated the two main principles of Roman politics, collegiality, that someone can veto you because no one had ever been kicked out of politics for disagreeing and limited term of office. His brother came 10 years later. Now, one of the great mistakes I see that Gracchus did is you don't try to take away wealth from the super wealthy without giving them anything in return. Gracchus did not cut deals, which is one of the big problems our Congress why we're not getting anything done, people are not willing to cut deals. Gracchus didn't have to get everything he want. There was so much land, if he got half of what he wanted, the Senate would have gone along with it. 10 years later, his brother Gaius Gracchus showed up. And like his elder brother, he had an, imper he had an impeccable lineage. He was a real firebrand. He would disrespect the Senate, which in a society based on hierarchy and status was amazing. He would turn his back to the Senate when he would address the common people at public meetings. And he was determined to get as much political power as he could. He passed many laws, so many, but many would benefit the common people. He would do public work projects, build roads, build buildings. And to get the urban poor out of Rome and improve their life, he was going to have 12 foreign colonies built. He also wanted to give the franchise the political vote to the Italian allies because the Italians who fought with the Romans had made up half of their army in every war that they fought, but they did not have the same privileges that the Romans had. This, however, turned out to be massively unpopular with the people of Rome. Well, the Senate this time didn't try to get him vetoed. They just outbid him. They got their own tribune, another bot tribune, a fellow named Marcus Livius Drusus. And Drusus announced to the public assemblies, why have cheap grain, government subsidized grain, that Tiberius Gracchus had done, when you can have free grain? Why have 12 foreign colonies when we can have colonies here in Rome? And also Drusus, instead of giving the Italian allies the vote, which nobody in Rome wanted, he wanted to make their military service less brutal. The mob abandoned Tiberius Gracchus, and then his political enemies decided they would go after him for his many affronts to the Senate. Tiberius Gracchus uh, decided that he would run again. Now, a law had been passed in this 10-year period that you could have two terms back to back. He called a political rally. In the rally, 3,000 of his followers were there. What the then ruling consul, Gaius Opimius, one of his slaves came down and rudely insulted Gaius Gracchus. Gracchus gave him a very dirty look, which his followers took as a sign that they should kill the slave, which they did. When this came back to the Senate, the then consul running Rome said, this is tyranny. So they armed themselves. There happened to be a contingent of archers from Crete there in Rome, off to serve one of the Rome's war. They employed them. A full-scale riot broke out. Gaius Gracchus and 3,000 of his followers were massacred in the middle of Rome. But the Gracchi had started the unraveling of the Roman Republic. And they had showed that any any serious attempt to change the Roman system would be interpreted by the wealthy as tyranny. But the Senate set the absolute worst possible example, and that was that if you went against them, they would kill you. Now then we see a really dangerous precedent being set in Rome. 
tribunes would pass laws bypassing the Senate, the most powerful organization, and that political opponents were now fair game for killing. We go now another 10 years, and we have one of the major figures of the Roman Revolution, a fellow named Gaius Marius, a genius general and a politician of just utter incompetence. A war broke out in southern, uh, northern Africa in the kingdom of Numidia. What had happened is that there was a dynastic struggle, and in this struggle, some Italian merchants, allies of the Romans, had been slaughtered by a fellow named Jugurtha. War dragged on, and it, was, it showed massive Roman incompetence. Their great competence that they had showed in so many other wars had abandoned them. They finally got a guy to deal with Jugurtha, but Jugurtha, he would beat Jugurtha, but Jugurtha would fight him in guerrilla war for which the Romans were not prepared. Then Gaius Marius showed up, who was an outstanding general. And he ran on the platform of smearing all the aristocrats who were screwing up the war. And he said, I'll end this war in one year. He ended it in two. However, that's a picture of Gaius Marius. This doesn't, there are some statues of Marius, some busts, where he looks far more clueless than he does in this. And that's quite appropriate. But he started to make changes in the army. His main goal was to make the Roman army more professional. Now they had won war after war after war as a citizen militia. That's quite amazing. But what he did, because there were so many less farmers to fight in the war, and there was so the Romans had lowered the property qualifications to be in the army twice, he went to the Roman poor and he armed them at state expense. This was to have massive, massive uh, consequences for Rome. One of which is that instead of citizen soldiers, who after their long military duty would come home to a farm or a business, we now had the urban poor who came home to nothing. They needed a retirement plan. But the Senate looked to the old ways, the most mayorum, and they would do nothing for these men. Now these men have been abandoned by the Senate after many years of military service, and they look to their successful general to protect them, to give them a retirement. And we're seeing that the army's loyalty is moving away from the Roman state to its generals. Eventually, Gaius Marius defeats the wily Jugurtha, and the way that the Romans do it, they realize that they're never going to catch Jugurtha. Jugurtha is too wily. So what they do is they get his father-in-law, a fellow with the colorful name of King Bacchus of Mauritania, to sell him out. And uh, Marius sends one of his lieutenants, a fellow named Sulla, to go capture Jugurtha, which he does. But Marius makes the critical mistake of not giving his lieutenant any credit for winning the war. He hogged the glory. Well, just as this conflict stops, the Romans are faced with a far serious. And that is, is that two gigantic migrating tribes of Germanic people, we never really know where all the Germanic people come from, Denmark, Sweden, Poland, Germany, they're just all lumped under the name Germanic. They are moving through France, down into Spain. Now they're headed to Italy. They have fought four Roman armies, and there's hundreds of thousands of them. The last one, 100,000 Roman soldiers were smashed because there were two armies led by consuls, and the consuls would not cooperate, and the barbarians fought them piecemeal, smashed them. Rome is in a panic. What to do? Well, they think, here's Gaius Marius. So they, they re-elect Marius for, his, for three more consulships back to back, which is unprecedented. Finally, in 102 BC, he crushes one of these groups called the Teutones, and then there's another group called the Cimbri that with another consul, he crushes. And he shows military genius in these campaigns. Now, we can see here, this is so amazing. They come all the way down here, they smash a Roman army, the barbarians go all, the all over the place, finally they meet Gaius Marius, he stops them. 
<coughs> and this is a wonderful 19th century painting of the defeat of the Kimberley by Gaius Marius. Well, remember, Marius had a lieutenant named Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And this, if you can see this, this guy is fierce. This guy is a sociopath, he is a blue blood, and he is also a military genius. He was as brave, both of these men were extremely popular with the army and brave in battle. It turns out that um, eventually Sulla becomes consul of Rome and one of Rome's great enemies, a fella in what would be now north or northern Turkey called Mithridates of Pontus, he leads a revolt of the Greek world against the Romans because all of the Greek world has been conquered by the Romans and the Romans at this time made terrible imperial masters. Mithridates convinces the conquered Greeks in Turkey to rise up against the Romans and in an event that's called the Asiatic Vester, Vespers, 80,000 Romans, Italians, and their slaves are massacred by the Greeks in one day. Mithridates kicks out the Romans, but he, he fights the major, um, the major, the minor Roman generals and armies because once Rome got its dander up in this period, nobody could stand up to him. Well, the Senate chooses Sulla, who is a genius. And uh, Sulla will take an army, and he's, the Romans have to answer for this massacre. Unfortunately, Gaius Marius gets him a tribune. He goes to the popular assembly. In the popular assembly, he is given command of this war. Now, by this time, Gaius Marius is 70 years old which is as old as Methuselah in Roman culture because most people died at age 40 or earlier. Marius has committed a massive, massive mistake. It was the Senate's prerogative, prerogative to appoint generals. That was not his job. Now what Marius did was technically not illegal, but it violated precedent. Then Marius sent some envoys. Sulla got his army together. He was just about ready to go over to Turkey and kick some tail. And the envoy said, by the way, you're not the general anymore, and this army is not going. Then Sulla called an assembly of his guys, and he said, by the way, you're not going to this war, and you're not going to get rich from this war. Let's go to Rome and fix it. On the way, uh, now, Sulla does something that had never been done. Again, we keep seeing precedents smashed. No Roman army had ever marched on Rome before. That was unthinkable. Sulla marches his army to Rome, and envoys keep coming. What are you doing? Why are you coming here? And Sulla says that he is coming to free Rome from tyrants because the people have impinged upon the sacred duty of the Senate. Now, Roman innocence is completely gone. He comes to Rome, there's fighting inside of Rome, Marius raises, hastily raises a force, they're all slaughtered. Sulla now makes demands of the Senate. He's going to make sure that none of the tribunes can ever introduce laws that conflict with the Senate. And he essentially moves Roman politics back over 300 years. He then goes off and fights Mithridates and shows absolute military brilliance. He gets uh, Mithridates to uh, finally surrender, but he doesn't really solve the problem of Mithridates because um, he has to come back now that there is a civil war in Rome that the followers of Gaius Marius have revolted against him. So after five years, he comes back. But after the fight in Rome, Marius flees. All of his buddies who helped him try to take Sulla's army, they're slaughtered. And now Rome is launched into its first full-scale civil war. Sulla comes back. He defeats the Marians in a year. So when Sulla returns, he decides that he's going to get revenge and he's going to have justice. In the process of when Marius controlled Rome after Sulla left, about a thousand aristocrats were slaughtered and all of their property was confiscated. Sulla kills about 1,300. 
and Sulla appoints himself as what the Romans called a dictator. In a very serious military crisis, it's great just to have one man make the decisions because committees can be too slow. That was the dictatorship, but dictators were to last only for six months. Sulla brings back this ancient um, practice and he essentially rewrites the Roman constitution so that never again will the common people impinge into the area of the Senate. In the process, as he, in the middle of the Civil War, we have the fella Gnaeus Pompeius, who we call Pompey the Great. And uh, there's armies all over Rome, fight Romans fighting Romans, Italians fighting Italians. And Pompey realizes Sulla's gonna win, because Sulla's a genius. And uh, he raises an army of 10,000 men uh, from his father's estate, he's evidently rich, and he comes up to Sulla and he says, hey, you're the guy, I want to fight with you. But you have to at, ask yourself in a republic, how does one man appoint himself the position to make the laws for everybody else? And how does one man raise a private army of 10,000 men in a land ruled by law? Sulla comes back to Rome after all of this fighting. He has captured 6,000 men, mostly Italians, not Romans. He assembles the Senate at um, the Temple of Venus. And right next to them, in the Campus Martius outside of Rome, he has these 6,000 men slaughtered. The senators ask, what is this noise? What is all this going on? He says, oh, there's just some criminals getting their just rewards. Don't worry, it's all being done at my orders. This is the darkest chapter of the Civil War. Sulla produces lists of everybody who has been disloyal to the Roman state, and they're all slaughtered. Their heads are returned to him, and a bounty is paid. Silla was determined that no tribune could introduce a law to the voting assemblies unless it first came through the Senate. The Senate was now supreme, but within three years, Sulla dies and all of his innovations, his regressive innovations, are undone because for aspiring politicians, it was just too darn useful to have tribunes introduce laws that bypass the Senate because that way politicians can get what they want. Well, we have the little interlude of Spartacus, which unfortunately, the 1960 Kirk Douglas movie was very entertaining, but it's a historical nightmare because it didn't happen that way. And uh, there was a Spartacus, and he did break out of um, a gladiator school in Campania, south of Rome. But eventually, the poor, the dispossessed, slaves, they joined him. He had an army of 100,000. And how does an army of 100,000 with no money get anything except pillage and loot? And the slaves were looking for payback. Spartacus leads them all the way to the Alps, and they don't want to go. They want to go back into Italy and get revenge. The only real reason that Spartacus did all this is Rome was fighting two wars at that time, one in Spain, one in Turkey. And eventually the Romans get their, their armies back together and they smash Spartacus. Spartacus really had no chance. The fact that his people didn't cross the Alps, Alps they signed their death sentence. But the two armies that smashed, and there were groups that split off from Spartacus. There was the colorful Gaul named Crixus. These two armies, one was led by Gnaeus Pompeius we saw, and another one, an even shadier character, Marcus Licinius Crassus, they take their armies and they park them outside of Rome, and it's time for the, cons the election of the consuls. Talk about blackmail. Both of these guys got elected as consuls with their armies outside of Rome. Next, we go to about 60 BC, and we have what really looks like the real death of the Republic. Two extremely wealthy guys, Crassus and Pompey, and the young, incredibly ambitious, and the guy with a work ethic second to none, Julius Caesar, they get together and essentially they rig Roman politics. They make all the decisions, 
they buy off as many politicians as they can, and they have a, a really good run. Well, I mean, we have PACs buying off our politicians here. We just have super wealthy guys buying off theirs. It's kind of like Karl Rove and James Carville working together with trillions behind them. One of the things they're determined to do is to get Caesar to become governor of Gaul. And uh, Pompey wants, guess what, land for his soldiers for his wars in Turkey. And Crassus wants to, to help the business community because he's a billionaire businessman. Caesar is, con is consul and um, he acts much more like a tribune than a senator. In fact, he takes all of his bills straight to the common people's tribal assembly of the plebs and he just doesn't even call the Senate. Now there is a group that absolutely hates these guys of the die-hard conservatives called the optimates, which literally means the best guys. And um, Caesar goes off to Gaul and he's there for nine years. He too is a military genius. They had some talented generals. And if you ever read the Gallic commentaries by Julius Caesar, it is one of the great works of ancient history. Well, now we are at 48 BC. Caesar comes back, and um, from his time in, as consul in 59 BC, he made a lot of enemies, the super conservative, the blue bloods, and they want to put him on trial. Not only do they want to put him on trial, he has just conquered Gaul. They say, we're going to take your army away from you. We're going to try you. And they put Caesar on the spot. Caesar wants to run for consul because as consul, he cannot be, you cannot be indicted while you're in political office. So now we come to Rome's second civil war. But you have to question the logic of these guys. Here's a guy who has gone all over France, Belgium, parts of Germany, and England. He hasn't lost a single major battle. He's got a giant army of 50,000 that love him. And these guys want to put him on trial and ruin his political career? Caesar says that he went to war for his dignitas, for his standing in Rome, for his reputation. It translates as dignity, but many Roman Latin words don't translate exactly. He only has a small portion of his army. He's left most of them in northern, northern France, but he swiftly descends into Italy, and uh, the conservatives are led by his old buddy, Triumvir, uh, Pompey the Great. Pompey flees to Greece. Unfortunately, Pompey disrespects Caesar just out of pride. He fights Caesar in Greece. Caesar smashes him. He flees to Italy, and he's assassinated in Italy by the Egyptians, not the Romans. Four years later, Caesar smashes a total of three more armies, and he emerges as victor. Unfortunately, Caesar could see that the Roman Republic was dead. Big money had gotten into to Rome. So many senators were, were bought off. So many voting groups were bought off. You had a senatorial elite of the super wealthy who believed that running the Senate and running Rome was their birthright. They didn't care for the common people. The Roman Republic is dead. Caesar appoints himself as dictator, as kind of like temporary king. The amazing thing about Caesar's dictatorship he gets more accomplished for the Roman people in six months as dictator. Jobs works, building projects, setting up colonies, training the Roman poor, setting, doing all kinds of things for them, draining marshes, improving Italy. He gets more done in six months than the Senate had done in the past 200 years. Sometimes an autocrat is good. But he goes too far. Now, he is quoted as saying that the word republic is just a sound with nothing behind it. And uh, the folks who ran the Senate didn't take that too well. What he did is he would hand pick magistrates five years in advance because he decides he's going to take a giant army and he's going to deal with some of Rome's Italy, uh, enemies, the folks in Romania called the Gaetai, and they've actually gone to war with the Persians. So. He's going to lead these two armies, but unfortunately, he staffs the Senate with his guys. 
He kicks a lot of the senators in this four years of civil war have died. Caesar packs them with his creatures and they give him honor after honor after honor. And he is voted lifetime dictatorship. He's no different from a king. Even though he's not lording himself around as a king, he's given this title. The amazing thing is, is that 60 of the people who fought for him in the Civil War turn against him and he's assassinated on the Ides of March. The amazing thing is that the assassins eventually flee and their leader is Marcus Brutus. They collect a huge army, they rob and pillage the Roman colonies in Asia, well, the Middle East to get money. And then uh, a new triumvir, a new three guys who support Caesar and want to avenge Caesar. Actually, it's the name of grabbing power. We have Marcus Antonius, who we call Mark Anthony, a real incompetent named uh, Marcus Lepidus, and Caesar's grand nephew, the guy that we call Octavius, who later was called Augustus. He became the first emperor. Well, essentially, we have these three, Mark Anthony, August, the young Augustus, and Marcus Lepidus fighting Marcus Brutus and his sidekick Cassius. It turns out that in this third civil war, uh, Mark Anthony turns out to be the man of the hour. He smashes his enemy. A few more years go along. Marcus Lepidus tries to make a power grab. He's kicked out. But eventually, Rome is just ruled by two guys. They've split the Roman Empire in half. The voting assemblies, who cares about them? And eventually, they're going to have to go to war because, you know, you can only have one top dog in the kennel. So the amazing thing about Octavius, the young Augustus, he shows up, he's 19 years old when this begins. And all the smart money would have bet absolutely against him. But he turns out to be a political operator of which there are very few in world history as classy as this guy. And they defeated their enemies. They've avenged Caesar, Caesar, but all they want is power. Now they mask it with nice flowery words, like many of our Fortune 500 companies do and Fed banks. And um, Mark Anthony, marries uh, uh, the young Augustus's sister, because how do you have political alliances? You have marriage. And uh, he, uh, he abandons Octavius's sister, and he falls in love with Cleopatra, of all people. And then what he does, uh, while in his time with Cleopatra, they have three kids, and in his will, Mark Anthony leaves huge section of the Middle East that's controlled by Rome, to their kids, like a king. This hits Rome and Octavius, uh, the young Augustus. What he does is he breaks the law and he goes to the temple of Vesta and he gets Mark Anthony's will and he reads it to the Senate. And the Senate is all upset because you don't give away Roman land without the Romans say so and they don't give up anything. So then this, he gets the Senate to declare war on Cleopatra, not Mark Anthony, because he's a Roman citizen. Well, there's a giant battle in a place of Greece called Actium, a giant naval battle, and Mark Anthony is defeated, and he does the unbelievably critically stupid thing of fleeing to Africa when just five miles away he has an army of 100,000 men that even if he lost the naval battle, he could go there and they could march on Rome, but he flees for some reason. These 100,000 men go over to Octavius, it's over. By 14, uh, well this is at 31 AD. By 14 AD, Augustus dies. The amazing thing about Augustus' reign, now they have a king, but they won't call him a king because they hate this word king, Rex. He's called emperor. And by 14 AD, all of the popular elections are gone. Power is located in one man, and in a period of about 67 years, the Romans have had six wars. Four civil wars and two other wars in Italy. Augustus comes along, 
He stops all that. They have incredible peace. For the first time in Mediterranean history, there is no war. The Romans have stopped all the little petty wars in Turkey and Greece. There is no fighting in Italy. And Augustus, with his autocracy, he is a military dictator. He is an absolute autocrat. He brings in 200 years of economic peace and economic prosperity, of which was not rivaled until the 20th century. But in the process, the Roman Republic died. Well, what can we learn about all this? Because I agree with the Greek historian Thucydides, human nature does not change. People do the same thing over and over. One of the things that this teaches us is that any kind of system based off of precedent and accepted boundaries that has massive innovations will collapse. So many times in the Roman system, where it's the system of precedent, people found legal ways to gain power oppressing the boundaries, and that destroyed all that had been agreed upon. The Roman Republic, the Roman Revolution, did not die like capitalists and communists. It died from super wealthy, powerful guys trying to grab power. Julius Caesar, Octavius Caesar, Marcus Lepidus, Mark Antony, and then the last Republican, Brutus. We see a Senate that did not take care of the Roman army because here you had all the landless poor. They were called the head count in the Senate because they had no property to register in the census. These guys had given their all for Rome. They do their 16 years of military duty, which, you know, by that time they're 35, 40, and most people are dead. So they need a retirement plan. The Senate does nothing for them. And by doing that, the allegiance of the army goes away from the Republic to their generals. We also see with the voting assemblies of the common people and the Senate a total lack of any willingness to compromise or any communication. Sounds like Democrats and Republicans to me. It was also inconsistent for the Republic to give rights to its citizens, and then they had conquered so many people who had no rights. And eventually, that got to them. The interesting thing about Rome, Rome was a city-state government that had all the same problems of small-town politics. And they were just structurally, they were not capable of running a worldwide empire. The wealth of their empire corrupted their politics in a way that they could not foresee. Because when the Republic died, finally, in the last Civil War, nobody could believe it. And people expected that they would return to the life they had already known. But now, there is no more Republic. There is, the civil rights are greatly, greatly reduced, like 95%. The old Republican values, I mean, the Romans were people, they thought that if you were not involved in your community, if you did not contribute, you were worthless. You served in the army for either, you know, a ditch digger's wave, or if you were wealthy, you served for free. But all of their values broke down when this incredible inflow of money came in. So much money that virtually any politician, 98% of their politicians could be bought. And we see that after six wars on Italy itself in 67 years, people will take bread and peace over civil liberty. Well, I will open the floor up for questions. Okay, so my first question is about the tribunes. Yes. Could one tribune overrule, or did there have to be a, a sort of a... Just one. Just one, even though there were many of them. You know, the, the incredible thing about the Roman system is that the tribunes could go into any political event. 
and shut everything down. And people asked me, well, why didn't I? Well, there was no point to it because you, know, you can't have a workable system if people abuse their power like that. But it only took one. So was that because of custom, understanding, or just the fact that, that they wanted to work together, the co collegiality? When Rome was first a republic, uh, the aristocrats were extreme, the blue bloods were extremely oppressive to the common people. And eventually, 20 years later, they couldn't take it. They revolted. They said, we're going to start a whole new government. And they copied it off of the Senate as it was. And the Senate consented and gave them officers, not magistrates, the tribunes. And um, what it was, it was the result of successful class warfare by the little guy. Does that answer your question? Okay. It, okay, last question for me and then I'll pass the talking stick. Um, this, it sounds to me like the senators just served in perpetuity. Yes. Okay, so the custom of only one term was limited to certain to, uh, officers. To the, consul, to the magistrates. The Senate, the magistrates mostly came from the Senate. And your judges, your generals, they came from the Senate. But the Senate itself was enrolled. If you met certain property qualifications and you had connections, you could get into the Senate. And you served the Senate for life for free. But you, I would love to do a study on the sweetheart deals that the senators got, because nobody works for free. So that's ostensibly, you know, for the public good or whatever, that they're serving for free. Right. But And many did outstanding work. Many did. Mm -hmm. Was it the tribunes or the magistrates? Power that one could overrule anyone else. Any mag uh, any consul could overrule any consul, okay. any praetor, and the tributes can come in. And the funny thing is, with their pagan priests, they could come in and say, "Well, we just cut open a goat and we looked at its liver, and the gods don't want us to do this today, and the whole thing shuts down." That happened from time to time. If they could do that, how do they avoid chaos unless they only? They only promoted they were, very popular They ideas. were mostly respectful. Oh. And, uh, I mean, they would really have to cut open a goat and say, oh my God, this is a bad liver. The gods are telling us not to meet today. Uh, but, okay. but sometimes the priests were used for political reasons. Okay. okay. Last question is, did I hear you make a distinction between Romans and Italians? Yes. What was the difference? The difference was, uh, the area around Rome is called Latium. But in Italy, there was there's like 12, at that time, 12 different ethnic groups. And um, you had Etruria to the north, you had Etruria to the south, you had the Ligurians, you had the Marsi, you had all these other people. And they also fought with Rome as Roman allies. It's kind of like Rome led this giant confederation, and because they led it so well, all the other Italian peoples um, let them run it. Well, did those areas have their own governments, uh, their own? They all had their, their own ruling magistrates, their own judges, but they all, um, in many ways, it was better to be conquered by the Romans because you would have peace and you would have economic prosperity. You, all it would cost you is some tax money, and every year you had to send young men for the army. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. What, uh, what matters uh, would, be, uh, would be brought to an election, and who, who could vote? Well, there was two different assemblies in the Comitia Conturiata that did wars, treaties, and nominated the magistrates, there were property qualifications. In the uh, plebeian assembly for the common people, there was none. 
And it and that one, any man, any Roman citizen could vote. I mean, it was it was this it was a chauvinistic world, and it was bad. Any more questions? Who fed the slaves? Would it be the person who quote owned? Them? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the the plantation owner or whatever. Slavery in Rome is, I read a lot that's, that's very questionable. The, the amazing thing about Roman slavery is they had an incredible high rate of manumission. Many people would be brought to Rome, they would get a trade, and usually in about seven years, they'd save up enough money to buy their freedom. And um, they then would become Roman citizens. They would take the name of the person who had owned, the family name of the person who had owned them, and then they would have their own name. Uh, the people who worked on the plantations and the mines, they didn't live too long. They were horribly abused. But the, the, most of the slaves in the city, though, uh, they actually lived better than many of the poor. So do the words sullen, brutal, um, pompous, and what was the other, who was the other guy? Oh, Sulla, Pompey, Crassus. Crassus, Crass. Do Crass. Do these words kind of come from this lineage the, of people? It, it's part of the, the, the system, and you know, I mean, Rome, Rome lasted some thousand years. And then the Roman Empire split in 400 AD, and this kingdom we call Byzantium, they lasted another thousand years. But Rome was a massively hierarchical society. Status was everything. And there's all these grades of status. And you know, if you're up here, you're looking down on the people here, and they're looking down at the people there. Uh, arrogance was built into the system. And when it's bad, it's really bad. Any more questions? So is your thesis then for this talk that what, what, would you, what would you say that your overarching theme is for this? Well, there's many themes. One of the themes is our founding fathers were really brilliant in that we have a constitution where just about everything is laid out. And innovation in our system has to go through the system. The Roman system was not like that. It was based on precedent with accepted boundaries. And the boundaries kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed till the whole thing shattered. So we are not the new Rome. Another thing is that the massive amount of the lack of communication and compromise between the Senate and the common people help destroy them. Also, they had a government that only, the Roman Senate lost all of its concern for the common people. And uh, they would use flowery language, but they were mostly concerned with benefiting from them because when Tiberius Gracchus tried to take the public land that they had kind of like stolen, but it had been in their family sometimes hundreds of years, and give it to the common people, he was murdered. But he, he is a case study in how a reformer can absolutely rip apart a system with the best of intentions. Because the Roman Revolution started with a desire to help the oppressed common people. But it was done, it was not, it was not done in a way that complemented the system. He started the unraveling of the Roman Republic. Now the Roman Republic had to die. How can you have a little tiny city-state government running 60 million people? It won't work. And you can't have any kind of democratic or quasi-democratic situation where money, the amount of money that flows in, you're creating billionaires on a monthly basis. It can't survive. Are you drawing a parallel to what's going on in the United States today in certain ways? Well, I believe the that uh, the Fed banks and the people who own them are just like the Roman citizen, the Senate, and they consider themselves above the law. 
If we look at the subprime crisis, it didn't happen by accident. It was designed. And it was, it was designed allowed. to make them wealthy at our expense. And then I have a bunch of minor themes. <laughs> What's a good book or resource to read more about this? Uh, For this period, there is an outstanding book on Julius Caesar. Oh my God, what's it called? The author is Adrian Goldsworthy, who is one of the best Roman authors out there right now. The Fall of the Roman Empire? Is that no, no, it's, not no it's, it's a biography on Julius Caesar. Yeah. Anything by Adrian Goldsworthy is, is outstanding. There's another fellow, I believe his name is Tom Collins, and he wrote a book called Rubicon, and that's outstanding. It's all this period. Does the Rubicon have anything to do with um, where the soldiers refused to go into the Alps? Yes, um, the Rubicon represented, and the amazing thing is we don't even know where the Rubicon is now. We, we don't know. It's probably dried up or changed its course or whatever, but this, this crossing this river that changed Roman history. Uh, we don't know where it is, but on one side of the Roman, the Rubicon was considered a Roman province, but once you cross the Rubicon, you're in Roman territory proper, and when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, he committed, in the eyes of the conservatives, treason. There was for him, because he was either going to defeat his enemies or they would kill him. It's that simple. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. You get to sit down now, it's your time to talk. So if you have any comments uh, for or against what the speaker had to say, now is your chance. So who wants to be first? I can't believe this. Nobody wants to be first? You want to be first? I just want to say thank you, Ed. Uh, me a lot of gaps in my knowledge. That, that's pretty much it. All right. Anybody else? There's got to be someone else. You got anything to say? Nothing? I can't believe this. This never happened. <laughs> What's that? Do, do you want to? What is your profession? I'm a financial advisor, but I'm I'm working on a graduate degree in Roman history. Oh, there you go. And I've, that makes sense. I've read 80, 90 books, so I, I can't stay away from this stuff. <laughs> wow. Addiction, addiction. Do you have more questions? Oh, oh. We don't have a, more questions. All right. Since we don't have remarks for levels. So what fascinates you about this subject? What has brought you, what has got you so interested in did it, was it in your childhood or from I actually, somebody you knew? It was five years ago. Uh, I spoke about applied economics and economics of daily decisions and understanding lost opportunity costs for so many years for business development that I just got sick of it. And I thought that I would write a speech for business development since I, you know, read a stack of books this tall. I thought, well, I need to leverage that. And I wrote a speech that I gave at the College of Complexes called The Leadership Principles of Julius Caesar. And the first time I gave that, I was ready to give up being a registered investment advisor, but nobody will pay me without a doctor. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. <laughs> and I study history because um, I don't believe human nature changes. And I think we can learn a lot from these people. And these people are in this culture in so many ways that are silent and quiet, and their influence is positive and negative. 
And I'm also, once we, now I hope to speak in six months, and the follow-up speech will be lessons from the fall of the Roman Republic, I mean the Roman Empire, because most people have no idea why they really failed. Right. But um, I'm so glad to say we are not them. Not yet. Not yet. That's scary. Here. Yes, ma'am. Microphone. Back. Oh. Pass it back, please. I, I have a couple 101 questions. Um, when was the first, do you know the, the date of the first emperor? The first emperor was Augustus, and um, he was officially in total control, 31 BC, after the Battle of Actium. Mark Anthony, who was a good military general, a good land general, was talked into fighting Octavius, Augustus, on the sea, of which he didn't have any expertise. And then he gets his tail kicked, and he flees to Egypt with Cleopatra, and he leaves 100,000 guys in Greece that he could have fought with. It, unbelievable stupidity. But uh, Augustus was at the Tiller of Rome about 41 years. Okay, I have a question um, about, when was the first pope? Do you know? That was 580. Oh no, the, the first Peter pope, Leo. the first pope, yeah. the, well, well see there was, pope was a title, and it meant kind of like head prelate, but there was a pope in Italy, there was a pope in Alexandria, we're probably talking in the 200s AD, there was one in uh, Antioch, and then one in Constantinople, there was four of them, and then there was the, the Catholics said, well hey, the guy in Rome, he's the successor to St. Peter. Okay, I have one last question. Um, how, what was the power of the emperor? I mean, can we compare it to any of the leaders now? The, uh, the political almost Joseph Stalin. Is it? I mean, wow. he had he had absolute total control over anything. If, if he says Tom Berry needs to be tacked up to a cross, he's tacked up like that. The reason I asked is when I went to Italy to see my daughter, uh, she studied abroad in Rome, I read the history of uh, Rome, mm -hmm. and it was like the first page. There was a, you know, this leader emperor. The next page he died. Then the somebody killed him, and then the next page was the pope at the time, and then that was about him. Next page, how he got killed, and it just seemed to me every page of this really thick book uh, was almost about every emperor and every pope being killed and uh, murdered. And um, I don't know if you know. That's just the way I perceived it, but it seems that's, like that's how you perceived it. The first 200 years of the empire, things were mostly smooth. They had a couple of psychopaths, they had Nero, they had Caligula, they were awful. But they had a lot of really talented military men. They had guys who were outstanding administrators. And we have to remember that the fact that the Romans could keep everybody from fighting everybody, because there had been just like in Greece, there was endless wars in the city-states. In France, with the Gauls, they were fighting all the time. The Romans stopped that. Now, it came at the cost of a whole lot of people dying, but with no war, there's all this prosperity, and the Romans cleared the Mediterranean of pirates. Um, and the Romans had 200 years of prosperity that was not matched until the 20th century. A whole lot of people had to die for that, but still, they had the. Uh, People were ecstatic when Augustus took over because finally all the war stopped. Well, did you die a regular death? I mean, or just be a... Uh, no, I mean, could you be a uh, emperor and just live, like, doing the job for 32 years or 40 years, or was it pretty short? It was different at different times. Usually, if you had about 20 years, that was a good run. Because, um, you know, emperors ate better than most people, but the average longevity, most people were dead by 40. And to make it to like 60 was 70, that, I, that was just like, wow, that's one in 10,000. So is there some kind of ingrained work ethic then that people would go and serve in, I mean, I know it was a requirement of a citizen to serve in the military, but knowing that their longevity was only this much. I'm not sorry. No. What, what, like, 
why would they even continue to do this when once they realized that people who were retiring from the military were just turned out more and not being because the Romans were just, they were so conservative. Even the common people didn't like a lot of change. And here they are clamoring for all this constitutional reform and equal rights, uh, but they still didn't like a lot of change. And uh, their, their ruling elites, they had the money to take care of their, their retired soldiers, but they didn't want to spend it on them because they thought it's their duty as Romans to fight for the state. Which is very easy to say when you're like multi-millionaire. But here's all these men coming home to nothing. And um, how, how come they're not revolting in the streets then or something? You know, if they've got nothing, how, I mean, because they could just be like put to death for... What's the motivation to continue to be peaceful <laughs> subjects? Well, Rome was so stratified. And they believed that, now they didn't like the ruling elites lording over them, but they were raised to believe that somebody would lord over them. It, it, our whole modern notions of democracy, they didn't understand because the, the Romans really, most of the ancient world despised the Athenian democracy where any citizen could serve and any citizen could be in a court. In fact, the Greek system in Athens, it only lasted 100 years. Um, it's called radical participatory democracy. And nobody in the world has ever copied the Greeks. Because it's a really weird system that they have, but for its time it was totally remarkable. In Roman society, they believe there's the good people, the people with money, and the people. And the good people should be running the people because they have the education, they have the experience, the business background, they have money, they have the name, and they're just better. They're just better. Because, look, it's like natural selection has put them on the top, so why aren't they running everything? And they're the ones with the experience of running everything. We can't have the urban mob running things. What do they know? <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, Rome ruled uh, Britain for about 400 years. Yes. And uh, I've always thought it would be fascinating. Uh, Latin never did seem to set in to Britain. Actually, uh, it did. But, but, um, but after, after Rome, after they pulled the uh, garrisons out, it pretty much reverted back to... Right, because... Uh, um, and the, uh, what had happened, Italy was pretty much collapsing, and the barbarians had everything to do with it. So they pulled out their small army there and then hordes of you know barbarians from across the ocean and from Scotland came down and um, they just reverted back to their old ways now you know they kept the Roman schools and they kept the courts and they kept libraries but there was just no more incentive for Latin because I've always thought if, if uh, British language had been Latin based then all of North America South America uh, Australia, New, uh, New Zealand, South Africa would, would have all been Well, but you know, Latin. Rome did come back to England in 1066 when the Normans came. And the Normans spoke a form of bastardized Latin. Oh, that's true. Archaic French. And 40% of our language comes straight from French. Archaic French. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Screwed up. <laughs> oh, it's screwed it's up for other reasons. Class. It's a mixture. But Latin is probably the worst language you could ever study. It's terrible, but I study it. Any more questions? Or any more rebuttals? I'd love for somebody to take a stand against me. I would enjoy that. Yeah, it could be for you too. Anybody? Well, come on up here. Ray's got the. You got five minutes. Yeah, you got to sit down. <laughs> well, some. Uh, comments about uh, the uh, first pope somebody, someone asked that question uh, first of all that of course the pope has to do with the uh, the Roman Catholic Church that's what you would normally think of if there were other kind of bishops or whatever it's then they and the uh, popes would have come after the time of Christ 
and uh, Christ the 30 AD or something like that. And of course it was uh, Caesar Augustus who is actually mentioned in the Bible who was the Caesar of the advent, the, the Caesar at the coming of Christ. He was the one who wanted to get rid of the babies because he was trying to get rid of uh, the, uh, of the, the one, the Messiah. And he tried it, but of course that did fail. Uh, Roman Catholics say that Peter was the uh, first Catholic, or the first Pope, I'm sorry. And uh, that's hard to prove. There's something that is written uh, something like 200 years after the fact, something we'll call it, say, 200 AD, that says that Peter was in Rome and was uh, a uh, bishop or something and supposedly a Pope for 25 years. If uh, you look and you talk to any biblical scholar, you can trace uh, the steps of Peter all over the place, but he never left uh, the Palestine area. No record that he could have spent any, uh, even a few years in Rome, and certainly not 25. So trying to prove that Peter was the first pope is uh, it's a stretch. <clears throat> but pretty soon you, all, you had a, uh, a bishop in Rome, and he's the one who ends up becoming the Pope. Uh, later on, uh, as Lloyd said, the, uh, the empire was so big in the first place it had to be split so you had the Eastern Empire which was Greek and based in Constantinople and then you had the Latin Empire and so you really had, uh, you had those two uh, 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 separate parts of uh, what was at that time really the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, even in, uh, uh, whenever uh, the Eastern Empire was the, was defeated, which is in 1400s. They considered that the end of the Roman Empire, the end of Roman Catholic, uh, Roman uh, Empire, that part of it, because some of it actually was still hanging on even to that time. the The western part did uh, uh, decay and die in the uh, 400s. Uh, one thing I did well; these other things I wanted to say, just the notes written down. <clears throat> I think it's interesting that <clears throat> even that far back, people were worried about tyranny. The words were, were mentioned. He mentioned tyranny and tyrants many times. Our founding fathers were worried that there would be some <clears throat> tyrant, some leader, who would be able to do whatever he wanted to do. And he would speak the word, and his word was law. And they did not want that. And like uh, Lloyd said, they set up the very best system that the world has known and it has given us this United States of America. And to this day, we are still the greatest country on the face of this, uh, this earth. And if we get away from those precedents, did you hear that word? If we get away from those precedents and perhaps our constitution we can call a precedent, then we are on our decline. <clears throat> And one thing that uh, these uh, powerful Romans did, they would reward their friends and they would punish their enemies. And the punishment might be execution. Those enemies would just go away. And the, and the uh, friends would multiply and get all kinds of wealth and favor. And we have heard that in our own day and time of those who would re reward their friends and would punish their enemies. We don't want any one man to make a decision. We want to be a nation under laws. And this nation under laws must be uh, an equal opportunity for everybody under the law. There should not be exceptions. There should not be exclusions, exemptions. If we have a nation under law, we will have equal opportunity under the law. We are not doing that. The health care law has been postponed at least two or three or four or five times. This is law. But one man has spoken and done whatever he wanted with that law. That's not a good precedent. That is not the way we want to go. We do not want someone who says he will reward his friends and he will punish enemies. That is a downward slope. That is a slippery slope. That is tyranny. It, it was passed by Congress, Ken. Yeah. 
and the president is violating the law. The law, the law says the, the employer mandate goes into effect January 1, 2014. That's about three weeks from now. It has been postponed. The president spoke. The president spoke, and it was postponed for a year. Now it looks like the, uh, the uh, individual mandate is going to be done. There's been other exemptions, exclusions, and favoritism. <clears throat> Hundreds or over a hundred. This is not equal opportunity. This is this is this is lawlessness, Erica. It is lawlessness. It, it isn't lawlessness. He certainly doesn't get everything he wants. He's been fought every step of the way. Thank My words exactly. Do you want to say something, Charles? Mm -hmm. In other words, gave them some more time, like extending the application of the penalty. That isn't the law. Well, yeah, that isn't the law. Do we have to bring up the health care? Uh, Rand Randall, the, it is a current event that is going on now that shows that, that, that we are trying to deal with one person making all the decisions, violating law, but we, not have, we do not have... It is the law. What's that? <laughs> Folks, I'm only trying to tell you we have got to have equal opportunity on the law. We do not want tyranny. We want to. We want to have a constitution. Let's do it. Let's go for it. One person at a time. Okay, who is next? One person at a time. Who, who wants to speak about tyranny? Who, who wants? Who is next? Who is our next speaker? You, you want to say something? No? Oh, come on. <laughs> this, this is Roman night. It's Roman night. You're going to have to put it in a Roman context. <laughs> Did I do enough of that? Well, anyway, uh, that was I guess I could have a couple things to say. Uh, I mean, first of all, I want to give our, I think our speaker did a great job tonight. It was, uh, he, he did a tremendous job, I thought. You know, he went on and on about the whole thing. It was, I can't remember it all. It's that good. It was, I'll, I'll have to hear it again. So anyway, it, it was very good. Uh, I was impressed with the uh, correlations to our time of today that you brought up. And uh, I'm looking at our country. You know, you say we, we, have, a, we have problems in our Senate and House. They can't seem to get along, different things. I think money has dictated a lot of things that have happened. And we have a, we have a situation where we have the best Congress money can buy. That's the real problem we have today. And that money is talking. And we have corporatocracy. We have a corporation controlling the government. That's what's happened. And, when, and uh, by definition, it's fascism. Corporation controlling the government. You can't have that. So, in my view, we've got to do something to get the money out of Congress. And maybe that would be to get Congress act in its own self-interest to instruct the Federal Communications Commission to require the media to provide sufficient free airtime. Airways are free for federal candidates in general elections to their views. Maybe the last 90 days of an election. And if you had free airtime, then what would happen is that challengers could possibly defeat a few incumbents here and there and the incumbents would end up representing the people that that elected them as opposed to represent the people that buying their vote in washington that's what we have to do if we do that we can then we can make other changes otherwise we can't make the we can't shorten the work day we can't put people to work we can't do that we can't we can't uh we can't put tariffs on corporations overseas it's they're not gonna let it happen because the money is bought the other way and that's what's happening uh, what he brought out in his speech here was that how the money had corrupted Rome. Well, the money is corrupting our Congress today. That's, that's the correlation I see, and that's what has to be attacked. That's, that's my view of what he had to say tonight, and I, thought, I thank him for what he said. And our speaker has to comment on all the comments that were made here. Oh, you want to make a comment? Go ahead. Sure. I didn't know that. Why not? 
I learned a lot tonight, and I'd like to just remark about tyranny because while you were talking, Ray, I went ahead and looked it up. Arbitrary or unrestrained exercise of power, despotic abuse of authority, a state ruled by a tyrant or absolute leader. If Obama is a tyrant for getting the Congress to pass a law about health care, this just doesn't compute to me. Because I, I do want to address that. A tyrant is somebody, tyranny, the act of treason, etc., is somebody who goes totally against the state. A tyrant is someone who has complete autocratic rule. If Obama had complete autocratic rule, the health care would have passed like this. It would have been a public, there would have been a public option. Instead, there was an amazing amount of going back and forth and back and forth and taking into consideration all of these um, private company priorities to put together this sausage of a law that included all these proposals made by Republicans. So to say that Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, that all of this is the act of a tyrant and that he is going against the law, I, I think that's just kind of ludicrous. And it's yet another talking point from Rush Limbaugh and whomever else is just out to destroy whatever is being done you know, let's stop, what is it, 48 times they've tried to repeal it? Just just get over it. Okay, but let's get back to... Let's get back to the point of Mr. Chappelle's talk. It has to do with the fact that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, right? Okay? In that situation, they did not have checks and balances, from what I can tell. One person, as he mentioned, one person could say, uh, let's see, we are cross with Gene tonight. So guess what, Gene? You're going up on the cross. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're dead. We have checks and balances in this country for a reason. And you may disagree with what the court, the Supreme Court of the United States did with respect to Citizens United, right? Which gave free speech and money being speech to corporations, to individuals who are not even United States citizens, to invest in our government, public officials with undisclosed backgrounds. Yeah, exactly. The undisclosed means that someone in another country who doesn't have our interests at heart can invest in our country and buy their, buy their politician, okay? And they're not required to be identified. Right, they're not required to be identified, exactly. We can't do that. Right. Other countries can come. Yes. One of the things What's I was just thinking that? about with Trick Tyranny, how could he be a tyrant when in 08 we elected Obama, the people elected Obama, um, and he walked to, he told us about all these two communities, and we knew in 08 to 12 that he was going to have the health care passed and we re-voted him again. Now that's not to me that's not tyranny. Because democracy. Because democracy. democracy. So I don't know where tyranny comes. He we voted for a man that would do something I don't, I don't want to take up. I don't want to take up more than my five minutes, but I'm 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 gonna say this. I'm gonna say this. I think the point of the talk tonight was a contrast, right? You go from being able to put someone to death just because you don't like them, they looked at you wrong, they didn't lean your way, you know, you were in power, you were on the upper stratospheres of power, and you could just 
to what we have today. No cruel and unusual punishment. Granted, there are abuses of this, as we've noted. You know, there's been a public outcry against certain abuses of this. Guantanamo Bay, whatever happened at Abu Ghraib, right? But that's not the norm. And the contrast is, in Roman society, that was the norm. You didn't like somebody. They looked at you wrong. They didn't bend your way. Guess what? I point at you. You're a tyrant. You're put to death. And I, I would hope that, yes, maybe human nature doesn't change all that much, but we are on a different path. We have that unique opportunity in this country to have the freedom to stand up, to assemble, to talk to one another freely, to have freedom of religion and freedom from religion, right? To be able to talk about things respectfully with other people and not constantly be accusing people of being tyrants or, or autocrats or dictators or whatever. Boy, if Obama's a dictator, why is, the, why is the capitalist system working so freaking well in this country? Why did the stock market just hit 16,000? I'm sorry, not the stock market, the Dow. Why did it hit that index? Okay? Honestly, let's pause a little bit. Let's thank Mr. Chappell for his excellent talk in imparting his knowledge to us. And thank God that we're not living in the, the Roman Empire, that we're in the United States of America. Any more speakers? Is that it? No, I got an ice cube in it. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm going to give this back to uh, Lloyd. He gets he gets comment and comment and close our meeting. So you have the chair. Well, this is a college of complexes first. Nobody argued with me this time. <laughs> <laughs> you argued with each other. Um, I will I will be giving next year two more college of complexes new speeches. I will talk about lessons of the fall of the empire, of which is not well understood. I see a, a great analogy. The republic died because of people fighting for power, raw, naked power, autocracy. I see that with our country, and everybody, I don't know if everybody was here when I talked about why we need to nationalize the Federal Reserve. Um, the Federal Reserve cr represents a system, and the system is the creation of money through debt. In our country, we only create money. Well, we create about 99% of our money through bank loans. And it is this system that is dominating us now. It is this system that is dominating the entire world. Because the puppet masters of Washington are not the Democrats and not the Republicans, but the people who write the big checks, the Fed banks. So to me, as Rome was destroyed by men seeking power, I see much of our life being destroyed by the system that is represented by the Fed banks. The Fed banks to me, with their investment banks, JP Morgan, Chase, Bank of America, Citi, this is, this is what makes Wall Street sick. And I will address that in three months. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to retire to the Starbucks down at the corner, so if you want to come down there, you're welcome. Sure. And we can pick at our speaker a little more if you like. And uh, whatever, whatever you want to do, it's this way, because this place closes at 9, they want us out of here by then. And uh, so we generally go down to Starbucks, and you're all welcome. What about the weather? Well, Nothing's happening, I don't think. This is William, your videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like us or follow us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call. 
So when visiting the Barbex restaurant, tell them you want your reservation to the next College of Complex class.